So the four Gospels, there are four of them. What are they? You know them. Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They each tell the story of Jesus uniquely to his audience. Now, if you want to know the whole story of Jesus, you might want to read all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew's purpose is to connect the Jewish nation to Jesus. Matthew's purpose is to point out Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah that they have been waiting for. So he started his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus. Let's stand as we read God's word out of respect. Matthew chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible, there's one in, all this, uh, in every row. Matthew chapter 1, divided into two parts, New Testament, Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew chapter 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus, Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Let's pray. God, we ask you to bless our study, open our hearts, open our minds. Father, forgive us where we fall short. Teach us your ways and show us your grace. We're here to worship. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Please be seated. I need some volunteers to really illustrate this story to you, that it will make sense to you. Because if I stand here and explain to you this story, you are going to fall asleep, okay? So I need to keep your attention for a little bit. So in the story of Tamar in Genesis, before the Exodus, there is this family. And you bring up this family, you Google it, they look like this. Jacob had 12 sons. That's what it looks like. Pretty accurate. Bible drawing. Okay? Jacob had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtal, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, uh, Joseph, and what's that guy right there? The last one, Benjamin. You heard Benjamin over and over and over again. But what you don't hear a lot is Judah. Judah is where Jesus was the promised Messiah in that lineage where he's going to come from. That's orchestrated by God. But you hear a lot more Joseph in Genesis rather than Judah. But Tamar, it's in the genealogy of Jesus. So, for this story, let's have a volunteer. I need a Judah. Uh, David, come on up. David, we, we need a Judah. Come on up. Come on. Thank you. Let's clap it up for <laughs> Stand over here. All right. Judah had a couple of sons. Okay? Judah's sons is Ur, Onan, and Shelah. I'm going to try to memorize all this because I've read this chapter all week long. I should know it word by word for word, okay? So he has three sons. Those are his three sons, okay? He married a Canaanite woman. Soon after that, he got a wife for his earl, his oldest son named Tamar. I need a Tamar. Priscilla, come on up. Can you, can you volunteer? Do you have any acting skills? Huh? A little bit? Okay. So, so Judah got his oldest son, Earl, a wife. Her name is Tamar. But I got to introduce you to Earl. So, but because uh, I need an Earl, go ahead, c- come on here, uh, Zach. But Earl was so wicked that God killed him. Thanks for coming. There you go. There's your short lived. There's his short lived upstage presence. So, so Earl was so wicked, so God killed him. So now, 
Tamar, it's single, but according to the law, right, according to the Jewish law, that she, it's not allowed to remarry because in the line of Judah, there are two other sons, Onan and Shelah. So Judah told Onan, I need you to go and sleep with your brother-in-law's wife to keep the genealogy going. But in Onan's mind, if I sleep with her and she has a son, he becomes the firstborn. That means he's going to get all the inheritance from Judah. So he was selfish, so he didn't want to. So I need an Onan. Come on, I need an Onan. So because of his wickedness, didn't want to sleep with the brother-in-law's wife, and God killed him. There you go. That's, that, he made it this far, right? Then God killed Onan. Now, she's in a predicament. What is she going to do? Two sons of Judah now dead. What is he going to do? Should I give my last son to Shelah, to Tamar? What if God kills him too? That is my only son that is left. I'm not going to sacrifice him. Isn't that cool that every story in the Bible whispers the name of Jesus, someone in the New Testament sacrificed his only son for our sins. But Judah didn't want to do that. So what did he do? He thought he was smart. So he said, Tamar, my son Shale is kind of young. I'm just not quite ready to marry him to you yet. Why don't you go home to your home, to your father, stay with him for a while, And when my son is older, I will surely give him to you. So Judah sends Tamar away. Go ahead. No, you're still on the stage. You're in this whole story, okay? So Judah sent Tamar away. After a while, Judah's wife passed away. So now he, a single man, with a son, after a period of mourning, he got up and he got dressed and he went to party with his friends. And on his way to partying in this town, Tamar got the word from her friends that her father-in-law is going to pass through the town. And the scripture describes she took off her mourner's clothes, her widow's clothes. For this many years, she remained faithful as a widow, waiting for Shayla to grow up because she knew that she belongs to the genealogy of Abraham. Because God promised Abraham that through his line, all of his generations will be blessed. Something within her that she knew that. So Judah was passing through on his way to parting his friend. He's standing right here. Tamar took off her widow's clothes. You don't have to take anything off. That's like rated R stuff, you know. We just, we just leave it this, okay? Uh, Tamar put on harlot-type clothing. She covers her face. The, the, it is prostitution. So she pretended to be a prostitute. And she went next to Judah. Now, the Bible is not very clear on what her intention was. Was she thinking that Judah is going to recognize her voice and bring him to his senses and say, hey, here's my son Shelah. I, I just remember. I'm sorry, Tamar. I should have given you to him. But that wasn't the case. She kept her head cover. Judah has no idea that's his daughter-in-law. So, he said, why don't you come and sleep with me? Don't say that, because that's, that's Eric's wife. You know, we're just volunteering. This is acting, okay? Uh, but he says, why don't you come and sleep with me? So she said, okay, but what are you going to give me in exchange? He says, a goat. Now, ladies, let me step to the side here a little bit, okay? This is commercial break. Girls, you're worth more than a goat, okay? I'm just letting you know that. Single ladies. You are worth way more than a goat, okay? 
back to the sermon. She says, a goat. He says, a goat. And shrew, smart, educated, faithful woman, she would respond like any smart, faithful woman would. Well, what are you going to give me until I get the goat? How about you give me your, your staff, your signet ring, and your cord? That's a sign of royalty. If you, give, if you are in high position and you give away your staff and your signet ring and your cord, that per- pretty much means you're giving up of your position. An irresponsible man, an irresponsible father, and ultimately an irresponsible person who is from the line of Abraham who shows no regards that his position, his seed, was supposed to continue the line of Abraham. So he gave up his ring, he gave up his cord, and he gave up his staff. Every story in the Bible whispers the name of Jesus. The son came home after squandering all his possession. The father runs out, and what did he do? Give him what? The robe. Give him the ring. Restore him into his position at my household, the story of the prodigal son. Now, he slept with her, and he went away. She took the cord, the staff, and the signet ring, went home. He had a great night of partying with his friends. It went back. Three months later, He got the word, hey, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is pregnant. She was a prostitute. In his mind, this is my way out. This is my way out. I don't have to marry her, my last and only son, because he might die, because I saw what happened to the last two sons. So I see a way out. Well, she's a prostitute. She violated the law of our people. She was supposed to wait until I don't have anybody left to marry her to. So she violated the law. So now here's my opportunity. I am going to put her to death. So he summoned his friends. He wanted to make a spectacle of her. He brings her out. Come on. Come on now. And he says, you are no longer in my family because you committed adultery. And she says, no, 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 no. I'm bearing the seed of the man who owns these things. So she brought out the cord, the signet ring, And the staff, and he realizes he's the one that has been committing all the sins. She knew something he didn't know. She knew the promise of Abraham. He neglected the promises of God. And he says one line in that whole story, she was more faithful than I am, and he restored her into his household, and she bears him twins. You can be seated. Good job, guys. And that is the story of Tamar. Later in Genesis chapter 48, verse 8 to 12, this is the promise of God. You can see it on the screen. Judah, your brother will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. You are the lion's cub. Judah, you return from the prey. My son, like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will 
tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choice branch. He will wash his garments in white with in wine with robes in the blood of grapes, his eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. This is God's promise to the Israelites that the Savior is going to come from the line of Judah, and that's what's going to look like. We're going to get back there in a second. And Matthew said, the father of, the father of, the father of, and his wife, the mother of, Tamar. In Judah's mind, Tamar killed his two sons. So he sent her away. At this very moment, Tamar, I can't begin to understand what this woman is going through. The hurt, the regret. Rejection, the embarrassment. She felt like the, she's responsible for the death of these two sons. She has nowhere to go. She has to go back home. She can't remarry. I can't imagine what this woman is going through. And I can't imagine if she is going to have any faith left to even lift her eyes to talk to God. But she did. She trusted God in her hurt. No one knows the pain that this woman's going through. And she trusted God in her hurt. And she knew That in Genesis chapter 22, God promised all nations on earth will be blessed through the seed of Abraham. She knew her story is just not going to end in the house of Judah. She knew her hurt, her struggle, her confusion, her rejection, her depression, her loneliness is not going to end in the realm of the promises of God. And some of you might go through this wondering, especially moms. I hurt for the moms sometimes. You know, as a dad, when my kids get hurt, sometimes you kind of pay attention, but then you kind of brush it off because you're like this tough and dad and you're my son and you need to be tough. But I see my wife's reaction is completely different for my sons when they get hurt. So I feel it for the moms, and I can feel the certain emotion, like I can't understand certain, certain emotions that Tamar's going through, but I can hear, I can hear the hurt. How can I go on? And some of you might be sitting in this room today, can God really love me through all this? Do I still play within his story of creation? Do I have a part? Do do I still have a part in this ongoing story within the scripture? I've been through too much. I've been hurt. I sin. I'm I'm lonely. I'm depressed. I don't know how my life is going to move forward. And how I'm going to make sense of this. And you feel like there's no point in praying. There's no hope in your future. Will any of this make sense? And I wish I had the secret button and just turn all those thoughts around and and make you feel better. But I can tell you this. Those are the moments in life. You lean in a little closer. You lean in a little bit. And you remind yourself of Romans chapter 8. And we all know that in all things, come on, read it out loud. And we all know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That when life gets rough, there's no 
motivational speaker. There's, there's no motivational quotes. It's going to require you to lean into your faith and trust God in your hurt. Verses like John chapter 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore. You will see me because I live. You also will live. I love coaching. I really do. And the best part about coaching is it's the obvious, right? The influence of, of a young person's life, hopefully for the better. And the obvious reason is like commitment and hard work, the sacrifices you make, those are all good. But the best lesson you can teach a young person in the game of sport, any sport, is that it's not over until the buzzer goes off. That it is not over until the buzzer goes off. You are always in the game until the buzzer goes off. A couple years ago, we played the number one team in the country, Paul VI out of Virginia. It was a very sought-after tournament, and we were invited, and there were 30-some college coaches there watching from every level. We got down by 15 in the third quarter. My starting point guard, who was being recruited by Division I schools, in the third quarter, we're down by 15. From half court, she walked off the court, sat next to me on the bench, and took her shoes off. So I turned to my assistant. I said, you better take her to the end of the bench before I embarrass her in front of everybody and ruin every chance she's going to get of being recruited. So he took her and brought her to the end of the bench, told her to put her shoes back on, and calm down. She didn't continue that game with us. And she didn't continue that season with us. A couple of years later, I was disappointed that she stopped playing altogether, didn't get recruited. That year, we went on to the state final four and won our district and all that good stuff without our starting point guard, a Division I point guard. And I tell you that story because what if we treat God like it's a game when things aren't going well and when you feel like you're down a couple of points, you just take your shoes off and you call it quit. But the journey of God like Tamar, when things get tough, when things seems like it doesn't make sense anymore, when things seems like, how am I going to get out of this? You tighten up your laces and you say, God, put me in the game. Those are the players I want, and certainly those are the players that God wants, because when things get tough, he doesn't want someone who's going to lose in the laces and say, I call it quit. It's not worth it anymore. No, he wants a Tamar who tighten up her shoes, who put on her clothes and say, I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust because I know what God's word is for my life. Put me in the game. You trust God in your hurt. And when you trust God in your hurt, this is so important for you to understand this because it's not even about us anymore. For Tamar, it's not even about her anymore. It was about continuing the line of Judah. If it wasn't for Tamar, we don't get Jesus. And it hurts for her. But she knew because when we trust God in our hurt, the world trusts our faith. When we trust God in our hurt, the world trusts our faith. You notice no one ever listens to the advice of someone who thinks going well all the time? But you seem to listen to those who's been there, fail and fail and fail over and over and over again, and then they made it. 
How did you do that? Tamar pretended to be a harlot. She saw an opportunity to continue the line of Judah, where Judah was neglecting his promise from God. And she slept with her, and they have, a, uh, they have twins, as the Bible went on to talk about it. But in her moment of trusting God in her hurt, she restored the faith of Judah. Because he says, she is more righteous than I am. You know, throughout this whole story, Judah never admitted that it was his son, sin, that killed him. Never. He was blaming on Tamar the whole, the whole time. He disregarded the promise of God and held on to Shelah because he's afraid that his one and only son would die as well. He came to his senses because he saw the faith of a woman who trusted God in all of her hurt and said, she is more righteous than I. Because when we trust God in our hurt, the world trusts our faith. Joshua was, was born in a, with a heart condition. That one of his heart valves was too small, so it wasn't pumping appropriate blood to the rest of his body. And in, the view, in an interview with the sports spectrum, the mom says, according to the Mayo Clinic, there is nothing else you can do. That Joshua is going to live with this condition forever. He might not get to play sports. And the mom decided that she's going to dedicate her son to God. Like, this is not my son. This is, this is God's son. But we're going to love him. We're going to raise him. We're going to let him be as normal a little boy as, as he can. We're going to put him into sports. But we're going to keep an eye on him. But we're going to keep, put him in sports. And they dedicated that boy, Joshi, to the Lord. The father, Josh, who says to the interviewer, there is absolutely nothing you can do except pray. A couple months ago, April the 19th, the world was in shamble for obvious reasons. Josh was sitting at his desk as he looked out the window. Joshy was playing a game, and he claps. The father cleared his desk and ran out. He grabbed the AED. He went over to his son, ripped his clothes open, put the AED one here, one there, and pressed the button, and it says, back up, shock, boom. It woke the son up, rushed to the emergency room, had an emergency open heart surgery. Here's the picture of Joshi a couple months ago. Who would have thought that his father was going to be the very person to save his life in that gym floor, huh? These are the words of his dad. Life is hard. Being a parent is hard. This world is hard. But God, it's harder. Today was a very difficult one, not knowing if your child would make it or not. I just copied this straight from his Facebook. Trying to be strong for my wife, communicating with others when I'm not certain. Prayer, scripture, Church, family, faith, Jesus, God, it's real. Anxiety, worry, pain, depression, defeat, uncertainty. If my son is going to come out of this surgery alive or not, it's real also. But I am amazed at 
the God-giving gifts, talents, and abilities of those who fix his heart. Amazed by my God who is faithful and able to do more than I can ask or even imagine. Yes, life, it's hard. But my faith, my family, my friends, God's word, prayers, my son, my Jesus, my God, it's harder. Well, it's like we have been saying it from the beginning. God got this. This was Joshi this past Monday, first day of school. They only live like 2.5 miles from here. Ordinary people who trusted God in their hurt. And I follow their Facebook journey the whole way. Encourages my faith and encourages a lot of people's faith. Because ordinary people like you and I, when life seems like it doesn't make sense, we trust God and the world come to terms with our faith. Through God's provision, he uses Tamar and her swift thinking to save the faith and the line of Judah. This is a testament to really God's constant mercy. No matter how flawed and sinful you are, God can still use you. And you know, and that's not because of our own effort in any way, or our own doing, or any type of our talents. It's, it's simply God's way of offering us grace, forgiveness and the opportunity to repent. No matter what you've done, or where you've been, and believe me, I've seen it all. I heard it all. I've been down that road as well. God's loves, and he loves you, and and his plans for you doesn't change. Tamar's name means Literally, date palm. The kind of palm that produces this sweet honey that God promises people that when you enter into this promised land, it's going to be filled with milk and honey. And her name is the date palm. It's the honey that God is referring to. And then Jesus comes along. He set foot into Jerusalem, and they took the date palms, and he steps on it. And he looks into the city. He says, I am here. So they took branches of palm trees and went out and meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus is your King today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He steps on the sweet honey that you've been waiting for because the way to get through the rough nights, the rough times, a rebellious child, a sick one in your family is to praise God in your hurt. And you tighten up your shoes and you say, my King is here. Put me in the game, God. Don't allow hardship to make you long to forsake God or to go back to Egypt. Turn towards Jesus, the land overflowing with milk and honey. Amen.